Um, this is my senior lecture. Uh, it's titled Not Another Wellness Lecture. I just want to thank Dr. Nick Anthony for giving me the idea and then Dr. Willis and Dr. Hassel for helping me out. Um, so how, how many of you have felt a burnout before? I'm sure we've all felt it, yes. Um, this picture depicts residency for many of us. Hi, Momo. Um, this too, we, we just keep saying, this is fine, this is fine, we chug on. Um, but at what point do we tell ourselves that this is now harmful for our mental health and our physical health? And you just wonder like, how did I get here? How did I get to this point? Um, so, and recently Medscape put out a physician survey um, asking about burnout and emergency medicine came out as number one for burnout, uh, which is not surprising. Um, and what contributes to burnout? So like bureaucratic stuff, working too many hours, uh, things like that. Um, and a lot of times it's a combination of these things. Um, and so what do physicians, physicians do to cope with burnout? Um, a lot of people exercise. I'm not one of them, but a lot of people exercise. Um, people get me time. Some people cope with drinking, sometimes on shift. Um, so how do we reduce burnout? So many people say like more manageable work schedule, increasing compensation, avoiding financial stress, um, increasing autonomy or finding like a new job. Um, so just keeping all these in mind, um, my topic isn't about burnout, but just keeping this in mind and when we touch base on this later on. So we're gonna switch gears and talk about, so what's going on with our workforce? Um, and so a recent paper came out um, a couple of years ago talking about what's going on in terms of the job market. Um, so they put together like a task force uh, made up of a bunch of organizations, including like ASAP, EMRA, CORD, and they essentially looked at all this data to see where is our job market going and should we be worried and what can we do to change things? Um, and so they talk about this um, supply and demand theory. Uh, so 15 years ago, they actually said that some supply may never meet demand. Um, and that's just definitely not the case now. Um, so looking at the supply, uh, which is us. So um, up until like the 2000s, med medical students, the number of medical students have been pretty consistent. And then it just started to slowly incline um, since like, like 2005-ish. Um, and then along with that, there's also been an increasing number of emergency medicine residencies, um, mostly uh, made from these for-profit hospitals um, that are working together with these CMGs. Um, and so it's, e EM is one of like the fastest grow growing residencies, um, which is partly due because it's, it's so easy to start a residency. Um, Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that a small portion of it is also attributed to um, when AOAs were added uh, to the ACGME. Um, in terms of like the number of residents, it's also increased. One from like new residencies, like I said earlier, and then another from like residencies just expanding the number of spots that they have. Um, so just from 2014 to 2018, there's been a 27.5% increase just over those four years. Um, again, mostly from these for-profit institutions. They used to make up only 4%, and now they make up 37% of the residencies. And so when I talk about for-profit hospitals and CMGs, like what are those exactly? And so CMGs are corporate and entities that contract multiple hospitals to provide ED physician staffing. And so they also handle billing, they handle scheduling, they handle liability insurance and like other important administrative tasks. And in return, these hospitals pay them this overhead fee where it's collected from physician reimbursements essentially. And so this really started back in like 1970s to 1980s when there was a business need for this, like there were failing hospitals 
and these guys would come in and help um, turn them around. Um, it, it was because like ERs were having trouble staffing the ERs 24 seven, there just wasn't enough positions. Um, and so the solution was like from the CMGs. Um, and so the, their bottom line is to make more money for the hospital. And that at a cost is our physician wellness essentially. Um, so it's estimated that they staff more than 50% of all EDs nationwide. Um, so looking at um, the numbers, so this paper talked about the predicted, like how many people are gonna graduate from residency until like 2030. So if, we, if you look at like the blue line, it's a 4% growth. The orange line is a 2% growth, it's a, it's a linear. And then the gray line is just no growth at all. Um, and the other thing to consider is attrition, which is people who are like retiring or leaving EM. And that's around like 3.5 to 4% a year. Um, and most of the time it's made up of older physicians because they're retiring. Um, and it's also like, there are people who work in the ER that are not EM boarded as well. And that makes up like 7%, but that's slowly shrinking. Um, the other thing to, to consider is advanced practice providers, which is like PAs and NPs, um, essentially seeing um, patients at a lower cost than us. And so this really started back in 2012 in the Affordable Care Act when they were awarded $200 million to educate and train these nurse practitioners. And so over this past 10 years, the number of NPs has almost doubled. Um, so yeah. Um, and going back to this supply demand, um, talking about demand now. So the number of annual ED visits um, prior to COVID was around 140, 143 million the ED visits a year and, and then COVID happened essentially. Um, it was a scary time for a lot of us. It was especially scary for those who were assaulted by these porn stashes. <laughs> I still have nightmares from this time. Um, and so COVID-19 in our future, so how has it affected us? And so it really affected us in terms of accelerating our future because this was supposed to be happen, happening further down the line, but because of COVID-19 and we saw this like dip in, in ED visits, it really, we really hit that, like we had a surplus without this demand. And so on top of that, these hospitals that were struggling financially had to close as well. So there were 70 hospitals, nation, around 70 hospitals nationwide that had closed because of financial hardships. Um, and so the aftermath. So, so what happened um, during COVID? Like we all saw this, um, there was a change to the workforce, there was a change to coverage, there was a change to benefit. 31% um, of physicians were furloughed, 21% were laid off, 56% took a pay cut, but doing the same amount of hours, um, things like that. And so, after COVID, so they're predicting in 2030 that we will recover in terms of the number of ED visits. Um, and by 2030, we should hit around a, between 150 to 163 million visits a year, um, depending on what the growth is. Um, so just doing a little bit of math um, in terms of the supply and demand. So with the supply of this 2% growth of residents every year with a 98% that enter EM and 3% attrition rate, the projected supply is around 59,000 physicians. And the demand taking into account if the visits per physician is constant and 20% of these patients are seen by these NPs and PAs, the projected demand is like 49 and change. Um, and the surplus is around 9,400 in 2030. So this is, this is concerning for us because we're gonna all be out of jobs. We're gonna be taking pay cuts, things like that. 
Um, and we saw that recently. So even before COVID in 2019, 20% of residents said that they had some degree of difficulty finding jobs. In 2020, when COVID happened, there were withdrawal of contracts and people had even more difficulty finding jobs. I mean, luckily, the, the class of 2021 was able to, they were all able to find jobs, but some of them had their contracts uh, rescinded. Um, and, 20, and this year, the market's a little bit better, but it's still been a struggle for a lot of us. Um, and definitely the compensation is not what it used to be as well. Um, so what are the proposed solutions to this? Uh, so one is that they're proposing to change all programs to four year programs. So if you have like a residency with 24 residents and instead of graduating in three years where eight residents graduate at a time, they'll say graduate in four years. So it'll be six residents at a time. So to sort of delay this graduation. Um, the other thing would be to like make more requirements um, to sort of, one to sort of like deter people from coming to EM. And then the other is that because CMGs are taking over and um, creating all these new residencies, they, they don't have the same standards as, as other places. And a lot of the times their teaching faculty is not EM boarded as well. Um, and so, and, and their point is like cheap labor essentially. And so, so yeah. Um, the other thing is increasing residency salary um, to, so that there are fewer of us because they can't afford to employ as many. Um, but this also comes with negatives because this hurts more of the, the nonprofit hospitals because they have uh, less money. Um, the other way to do this would be to standardize NP and PA training for, in terms of like safety. Um, and expanding the scope of EM, which is what I'm gonna touch upon. And really like the only thing that we can actively do ourselves. Um, and so, so really how did this affect us this year? So even looking at the match this year, there's 219 unfilled EM spots and they're not gonna be unfilled. They're probably soaked. I don't know the numbers for that um, as well. So compared to like previous years, significantly less. Um, so yeah. Um, there was also a recent study that was published back in January that did a retro retrospective study that was 10 years of data that they looked at in Epic Records at this Hattiesburg clinic uh, out in Mississippi that's a, a large multi-specialty group with multiple locations. And, and they had a shortage of PCPs. And so they tried to fill that gap with NPs and PAs. Um, and so they're, they essentially were saying like, this could probably save us money because it's cheaper labor. Um, but the conclusions that they saw after they looked at all of this data was that physicians actually outperformed them on nine out of 10 metrics. One being vaccination rates, which is surprising because it's within their scope of practice. Um, the other thing is cost. Uh, so that's what matters to people is that um, these APPs is what they call them is they're spending $43 more per month per member that they're seeing. And if you adjust for risk, then it's actually $119 more per month. And so if you take into account like how many patients there are, they had like 20,000 patients um, within this network. And if 20,000 patients only had APPs as their primary care provider, it would add up to be $10.3 million of annual spending, extra spending um, that they would be doing. And if it's adjusted for risk, it's 28.5 million. So the, the, the reason why they were spending more is because they were ordering more tests. They were doing more referrals. They were sending patients to the ER. Um, in terms of utilization and referrals, uh, the APPs were actually 1.8% more likely to, to send someone to the ER, even more than per, a person who didn't even have a PCP. Um, and they also had 8% higher referral rates per disease to specialists 
than a primary care, than a, than a physician. And when APPs saw these patients in a specialty clinic, they were also more likely to refer them out to like another specialty bypassing their PCP. So um, in terms of also like patient experience, physicians also scored better on that because they provided better communication and stewardship. Um, so yeah. And looking nationwide in terms of NPs, there are 14 states where NPs can practice independently, uh, which is kind of scary to me. Um, there are 15 states on top of that who where NPs can practice independently after they practice under a physician for either six months to four years, depending on the state. Um, and just to give you like a frame of reference, we spend 5,000 clinical hours in um, medical school and then 8,000 clinical hours if you're in a three-year EM program. So it's just, it's just kind of crazy to me. I don't want to, I'm not like trying to speak poorly of NPs or PAs. It's just highlighting the amount of hours that we put into our practice and profession to recognize sick from not sick. And we still get it wrong. And so these people are going out and practicing on their own after like a thousand hours of clinical um, time is just kind of scary to me. Um, so after they got all of this data, they actually changed their model. So NPs and PAs are, were no longer allowed to practice independently. Um, at this facility and all patients were supposed to have a physician PCP and sometimes they would they would have patients who have both so they would see a PC a physician at one time and their next visit they would see an APP um, but they always saw a physician at some point um, they actually use this data in legislation in Mississippi Mississippi to prevent um, these APPs from functioning independently, essentially. Um, and this could be a game changer in terms of their job description and our specialty as well. So, yeah. All right, so all of this to say that we should probably get into some side hustles. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and make that money. So, so um, so what is the side hustle? So a side hustle is a sideline that brings in cash, something that's other than your main job. So it's something that increases your bottom line to increase your financial independence, um, something that you're, you could be passionate and enjoy. Um, so I'm going to just touch upon some of them, not all of them, um, but also interspersed will be some quotes from our classmates and attendings. All right, so telemedicine, telemedicine actually blew up during COVID. Um, uh, a lot of companies would contract physicians for telemedicine visits. Um, some places even now like require you to do a certain amount of telemedicine visits as part of your contract or they offer telemedicine as something as a side gig just to make an extra, just so physicians can make extra cash. Um, typically they pay 100, 125 an hour. Um, they pay, sometimes they pay per hour, sometimes they pay per patient um, and usually treating like fast track patients essentially. Um, so if you guys don't know Brian too, he was class of 2018. He is also known as Eden Kim's work husband. Um, he said, I'm now full-time virtual medicine and work from home. It provides flexibility. I was getting burnt out in the ED and this saved my career. So now my job, my ED job is my side hustle. Um, he also does a little bit of consulting as well. Uh, and so Eden Kim said, I'm gonna do an OnlyFans where I just refuse to do whatever the audience says. It's gonna be great. <laughs> and Trevor goes, I'm in daddy. <laughs> All right, and then there's also consulting. So consulting can be anything really. Um, it can be like you're consulting for an, um, uh, a law firm where you're evaluating like disability claims. Um, it can be like you're working for a hospital to, to um, 
improve work environments or how to make more money for the hospital or introducing new technologies like when we had when epic was introduced to to our facility and they had all those physicians walking around helping us navigate it um you can also be a consultant for like a tv show um i met a guy who was a consultant for er actually and he just worked like once a week and he was like the happiest guy <laughs> Um, so for consulting, it's like lower risk, you get higher income, there's low overhead, there's flexibility, you're never on call, there's less out of pocket, there's no malpractice. Um, but it, and so when I looked up how much they make, the Bureau of Labor Statistics say 100 to 180, but I think it really depends on what the job is and um, things like that. Um, so Bobak said his dream job was to have a book cafe. He actually did a little bit of consulting where he uh, helped the mega testing centers start a telemedicine program. Um, he said the opportunity just came and he started out of curiosity and continued it because of the money. Uh, it was a cool temporary project. It diversifies my practice, adds to my skills, helps with wellness by serving as a non-clinical activity. And Julian said, I wanna do consulting because they make a buttload of money then use that money to open up a cigar lounge. And Rollo said, I wanna own part of a weed store because they are going to make so much money. <laughs> and then you have expert witness. So expert witness is kind of like consulting, but a little bit more in depth. Um, so it's someone who's an expert in their field, um, who is called upon to, um, advise attorneys on whether or not it's like a good case to take or help test or testify in court where they assist the judge or the jury to to reach a decision and they can make anywhere between 200 to a thousand dollars an hour um, more if you're called to testify um, uh, it's just hard i think it's just hard to to get into the market um, so dr silverberg actually works as a, an expert witness. And he said that he doesn't really like to testify against other doctors. Um, most physicians don't, but the money is good. Uh, he said initially he was charging 450 to 500 an hour, but now charges around 750 an hour um, because he just doesn't want to take too many cases. Um, he likes to support the underdog um, in these cases, because a lot of the times the hospitals have these lawyers that will drag out the case and make it costly for the patients. Um, he said most depositions are about 100 to 150 pages long. Uh, you can work as much as 12 to 24 hours more if you're being called upon to testify. Um, the other thing is that you, you kind of have to be flexible for this job as well, because a, an attorney can just send you paperwork and ask for it back within a certain amount of days and, and, or like you have to travel for certain things. So you just have to be a little bit, a little flexible for this. Um, um, what else? Oh, the other thing is like to be a specialist um, so that you get um, called upon more uh, by, like publishing things in a specific field or disease, um, things like that, so that when attorneys look you up, you're, you have credibility. Um, yeah, uh, maybe you can now afford your own hair extensions. <laughs> Don't slap me. Uh, Mark Zwilly said professional video game tester is what he wants to be. Um, event medicine is another. Uh, option. Um, a few of our attendings do it, uh, Dr. Topchi, Dr. Sawe, and Hannison. Um, I'll take part in Breville as well, um, do a little bit of event medicine on the side. Um, the pay varies. Sometimes it can be like no pay at all, like Burning Man. They don't pay you at all. They don't even cover your ticket. You just do it because you want to. Um, other events, um, it can range between like 100, 180 is what I was told. It can be more depending on the event as well. Um, 
So there are companies like Paradox, Paradox, I think that's what it's called, um, who can contract you out to, to these places. Um, so Hannison actually works for Paradox. Um, he said, I enjoy taking care of people at these music festivals and providing them with the opportunity to treat on the spot to get back to the concert. Uh, one memorable moment that he had was suturing up a forehead laceration to the music of Travis Scott, performing on stage only about 100 yards away. Um, I leave every event satisfied and look forward to upcoming opportunities. Um, the other thing that he had mentioned was that most people don't do it for the money. They do it because they, they like going to these events. Um, so, yeah. I used to do it also when I was in college. I was like full city and I was like right with the ones there. They also didn't pay very well, but put a little in my game. I have worked for a company where they pay you to like, there's a law in the books if you have more than 500 people at a gathering, you have to have a position on site. So they have to have a position group that has staff, like just meetings. So I've done like DHL meetings and like drug art meetings. I got to be there for that too. They don't pay that good, they pay like $151 a day, not even per hour. But they do pay for your transportation, they pay to put you up there, they pay for your meals, and they can be all over the world. Like there's some in Milan, there's some in Hawaii, but there's also some in like Tennessee. So it's all dependent on where they send you and what you do. Yeah, I was also told they can send you to do like some concierge medicine, sort of. One of our grads does that, he does uh, a kid's name is Thomas, he's a concierge doctor in New York City. Mm -hmm. And pretty much he just advertises it down there, comes to people with someone's school or something. You'll go there and give like some swab injections or communion. You'll come sit you up in the room. At least one of the guys from my class has had that for like many years. <laughs> Sorry, Chris just texted me. Huh? Okay. Or you could invent something, something that someone needs. I know it's harder to do than what's what I said. <laughs> Man, I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> so someone was tired of being squirted in the face and they, they invented the super shield. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, so KJ said, wearing a helmet with curly hair, that's a wrap. I'm going to invent something with two holes for hair puffs. And so when I was looking up pictures for this, I found someone invented the Kelly. This is weird to me. I don't know who would wear this. But I just worked with Kelly last night. He really looks like this. <laughs> um, I also found the Valeski. Or literally any one of these men. <laughs> um, you could also start a business. Um, actually, K2 uh, said, my sister and I have an Etsy where I sell caps. So they're, it's called Killer Threads. Check them out on Etsy. Um, there's also these like hydration clinics, which is a lot of overhead to begin with. Um, but once you get the licensing, the permit, the location, the RN, um, and purchasing the supplies, I think it's mostly like a startup. Um, I looked up on a website, like how much are they charging these people? And it's, it's kind of insane. Who's getting NAD plus? For $750. <laughs> um, there's also like Botox clinics, Medi spas. Um, they provide like aesthetic services, vein treatments, laser treatments, facial peels, and treatments like that. Um, there's also a ketamine clinic, which is apparently one of our grads opened up. <laughs> um, they actually make a lot of money too. So, like, uh, I look. I found somewhere like a place with five rooms can make up to seventy-five thousand to a hundred thousand dollars a month, and potentially double that if they're fully booked all the time. And part of the reason why is because you can charge for several sessions. You never just charge for one session. Um, so you go in like that and you leave like that. Who doesn't want that? Um, there's also wound care clinics. Uh, you can treat pressure ulcers, diabetic ulcers, these non-healing surgical wounds uh, with debridement, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, negative pressure therapy, compression socks. And so again, it's just like a lot of the overhead. Um, <laughs> Matt Barron said he wants to do animal husbandry, like goats and llamas. 
And then I asked Jamie Choi, what does he want to do as a side gig? And he says, Batman. <laughs> and then Little was next to him. So Little said, I want to be Spider-Man. And Kelly, of course, goes, I want to be Mary Jane. <laughs> And if all else fails, our EMIM chief is saying, I'm going to find myself a sugar daddy at www.sugardaddy.com. <laughs> all right, so what's your side hustle? Uh, so you have to consider like how much you can make, what's your time worth? Um, should you just work more at your current job? Because a lot of the times we just think, oh, we want more money, we'll just take on an extra shift, but you can actually burn out pretty easily doing that as well. Um, yeah, I want to thank my class, uh, without, like Alex always says, without you guys, I would be dead in a ditch somewhere. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Willis, uh, for being so supportive during my maternity leave and the rest of the APDs as well as the rest of the entire residency. Um, I want to thank my family, the best family out there, K2. <laughs> Uh, and this, when we all did the David. Because I love David. <laughs> um, all right. I also want to let Trevor know, if Trevor's out there, that we will never forget this moment that you shamed us all. All right, that's it. Thank you guys.